In the previous lecture, we discussed how to enter the stage storage discharge relationship into RMC RFA. But in this lecture, I'm going to go over the ba basic methods and equations, along with a few rules of thumb that can be used to calculate the spillway discharge rating curve for an RFA model. So I'm going to cover the four spillway flow regimes, the typical rule curves for gated spillways, some common mistakes to avoid, and I'm going to demonstrate how to extrapolate the rating curve. These are the two documents I referred to earlier. Um, there are USACE guidance that can be very helpful when estimating rating curves for gated and ungated spillways. USACE Engineering Manual 110-2-1603 is the hydraulic design of spillways, and USACE Engineering Manual 110-2-1605 is the hydraulic design of navigation dams. Um, and there's also another great reference that you can find um, a draft document that is the spillway capacity for the Willamette Basin dams. So if you have, are curious about that one, um, let us know. There are generally four flow regimes for spillways, and the name of each regime describes the effects of the tailwater and the headwater conditions and the effects that they have on the discharge capacity. The discharge for a free flow regime is not affected by the tailwater, whereas the discharge will be reduced by tailwater effects for a submerged flow regime. The discharge for an uncontrolled flow regime is not affected by the spillway gates or any other obstruction to flow, whereas discharge for a controlled flow regime is reduced when the spillway gates are un in the water. And these pictures hopefully can kind of explain what those names are referring to. In this presentation, we're going to focus on the two types of flow regimes that are common for high head dams, which are free controlled flow and free controlled, sorry, free uncontrolled flow and free controlled flow. Okay. When we design a spillway rating curve or when we extrapolate an existing rating curve, the Weir, Weir equation is typically used for ungated spillways. The Weir equation should also be used for gated spillways when the gates are open far enough for the gates to be clear of the water, because that's a free uncontrolled situation. The discharge Q has units of feet cubed per second. The discharge coefficient C is dimensionless. The effective spillway length has units of feet, and the energy head HE has the units of feet as well. The discharge coefficient can be estimated using various design charts that are found in the engineering manual 1110-2-1603. Um, and the discharge coefficient is mostly a function of the approach channel depth relative to the design head. Some of you may have had the opportunity to use these manuals before. Um, and one thing I would caution you is that it's important to make sure that the the figure that you use corresponds to the dam characteristics that you have. It's really easy to use the wrong one. Um, because some of them have a flat face and some of them have an OG weir and some of them have um, different characteristics. So you want to make sure and use the one that's appropriate for the um, setup of your actual dam. It's important to always use the effective crest length. So this is kind of an important thing. This is a common mistake that people make. So it's important to use the effective crest length when calculating a free and controlled discharge using the weir equation and not the physical length of the actual spillway crest. The effective length will always be less than the physical length because of flow contractions that occur near abutments and piers. Do not use the physical length of the crest because it will overestimate the discharge that's available. The effective length depends on the physical length of the spillway crest, the number of spillway piers, contraction coefficients for the abutments and the spillway piers, and the head that's above the spillway crest. And you can see that equation up there at the top. Discharge estimates for free controlled flow can be calculated using equation 6-1 from the engineering manual 1110-2-1603. This equation is known as the orifice equation. The discharge Q has units of cubic feet per second. The discharge coefficient is dimensionless. The net gate opening G naught has units of feet. The gate width B has units of feet. Gravity uh, is 32.174 feet per second squared. And the head at the center of the gate opening H has units of feet. Now, when you are calculating the orifice equation, um, there are, you're going to have to use some geometry and trigonometry to make sure you get these 
um, values correct. And if you're lucky, your design documentation might have some of these already shown in drawings, um, but you might actually have to do some math. And so um, that draft document I mentioned earlier about the Willamette dams shows how to do some of that trigonometry. Um, so let us know if you're curious. When calculating free controlled flow for a gated spillway, the gate width is the physical width of the gate. The effects of pier and abutment contraction are accounted for in the discharge coefficient. The nominal gate opening is typically reported in the water control manual and is published and also in published rating curves because it's easy for operators to implement. The nominal gate opening is typically the vertical distance from the gate seat elevation to the bottom of the gate. The net gate opening and that's the one that you need for the equation, is used for calculating the rating curve because it represents the area that is perpendicular to the direction of flow that's passing through the gate opening. The net opening is the minimum distance from the bottom of the gate lip to the spillway crest. The minimum distance comes from a line that is perpendicular to the spillway crest and intersects the bottom of the gate. Calculating the net gate opening requires a solid understanding of geometry and trigonometry. The nominal gate and net gate openings are typically not the same value. Always use the net gate opening for calculating the discharge rating curves and use the nominal gate opening when reporting and publishing discharge rating curves. And I'll just highlight that a little bit more. You can see kind of in this picture that one is the vertical distance and one is more of a diagonal distance that's perpendicular to the flow. The published discharge coefficients in Engineer Manual 110-2-1603 were generally developed from physical model studies with three or more spillway gates in operation. Discharge coefficients for a single gate would be a bit lower because of the pier contractions. The coefficients are reasonably accurate for gate opening ratios that are less than about 0 0.6. Calculated discharge estimates will be less accurate outside of these parameters. For stable, uncontrolled flow, the bottom of the gate needs to be clear of the water surface snap profile with a reasonable allowance for freeboard. Unstable orifice flow occurs when there's not enough water above the bottom of the gate to provide a stable condition. And this can result in vibration of the gates and machinery due to surging of water upstream of the gates. We do not want to operate underneath those conditions because it can damage the dam, which is bad. A stable orifice flow condition occurs when there is enough water on the gate to maintain stable flow conditions. In this plot, we see pool elevation versus gate opening. The blue curve represents the minimum stages required for free and controlled flow. In other words, the blue curve is the threshold between free flow and transitional orifice flow. The pool elevation gate opening combinations below the blue line will allow discharge to be in the free flow regime. The orange line represents the maximum allowable stages required for free controlled flow and stage gate opening combinations above the orange line are full orifice flow. Between the orange and the blue lines is the transitional orifice flow section. During, um, the, as I mentioned on the previous slide, during transitional orifice flow, the discharge may surge and cause vibrations, which can cause damage to the gates and the dam. The big picture is we need to avoid operations in this range at all costs. For stable uncontrolled flow, the bottom of the gate needs to be clear of the water surface snap profile with a reasonable allowance for freeboard. Unstable orifice flow occurs when there's not enough water above the bottom of the gate to provide a stable condition. This can result in the vibration that we talked about and a stable flow condition occurs when there is enough water on the gate to maintain stable conditions. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll just assume um, that we need about a foot up on the gate to make sure that we're capturing um, the nap profile with some, with a little bit of conservative wiggle room to make sure that we're not um, in that vibrating range. Um, I don't know if you guys have had the occasion to see surging. Um, it makes a lot of noise usually, and usually there's some, a little bit of panicking that happens, and operators will be like, ah, and then and make a gate change real quick to make sure that that vibration doesn't happen anymore. Um, so usually it's okay, but um, I mean, usually they get out of it pretty quickly, but um, it's something to, to be aware of, um, and we can calculate what that range is. So 